So, we've been around for a year. Cyber McCyberface, come on, do I not even get a little giggle for that? <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a bit about sorry, what we said we would do in November last year and then some of the results we've got over the last year, so the early results. Um, so last year, finishing this event last year, I said we're going to have a measurable effect because most cybersecurity that you see is based on fear. And I'm a mathematician, so I like numbers. So I think we should be able to measure the impact of what we do. And I'm going to go through some data. It's a cybersecurity presentation with data. This is not something you will see often. Um, to try and show you some of the stuff we've done. Um, about two, three weeks after the Wired conference last year, we launched this. This is the National Cybersecurity Strategy. Um, I got into trouble when we launched it because I said it wasn't completely crap. Now, I stand by that. It is not completely crap. Most government strategies are write-only documents. This is actually worth a read if you've not read it because it's totally different to any other government cyber strategy. It's, it doesn't just say, you should all do better and share information and the world will be better because we've kind of shown that doesn't work. So this is more about how we intervene, how we change the, the incentive model, how you change the marketplace so that cybersecurity is the default for most people most of the time. And I'll show you some of the stuff we're doing to try and do that. Um, again, last year, I talked about a couple of things we were going to do about intervening. When we launched the strategy, we published this, and there's a blog on the NCSC website that talks about this. Um, this is a set of active things that we're going to do, that we've started. I'm going to talk about three of them today. Um, that we believe will fundamentally change security in the UK for the better. I should really say for the better, right? It's going to be much better. Um, but some of the things that are on here are really simple but have a really disproportionately large effect. So most cyber attacks start with a dodgy email, right? Yeah? Who's been told never click a link in an email unless you trust it? Yeah? It's stupid. You cannot possibly understand how to trust an email as a, as a normal person. So the top of this is about using something called DMARC to stop the majority of spoofed emails turning up. And I'll talk about some of the other stuff we're doing as we've seen the adversaries respond. Down at the bottom, we've got a DNS service for public sector. So we've built a DNS. Actually, we haven't because it would be terrible if we built it. Nominet built it. Um, seriously, government engineering. <laughs> Go to an expert. Um, so we've built a DNS service for all of public sector. I'll show you some of the early results of that. But the idea is, if you're in public sector, you don't get to go to things we know are bad. Right? And then how do you scale that out? Well, over there on the right-hand side, you've got ISPs. So the idea is, we'll give the ISPs we, the data that we protect government with. And they can voluntarily go to all of their residential customers and say, hey, we'll protect you for free. Right? So by default, I want everybody in the UK to be protected unless they opt out because that's the sort of scaling where you start to have a measurable effect. And there's a bunch of other stuff. There's a load of blogs up there on, on the website about all of this. I'm going to take you through a couple of things. So, email. DMARC. Hands up if you know about DMARC. Anybody? A couple of people. So DMARC allows you to take control of your domain. And it says, my email will only ever come from these IP addresses, and it will be signed by these keys. And if either of those things don't work, either deliver it but tell me, Stick it in the quarantine spam folder and tell me, or don't deliver it and tell me. We've built something that starts to process DMARC records for public sector. And this is our shiny dashboard. It's a shiny dashboard v0.1. It's not released yet. But this one says that in uh, 20, what was it, three weeks of September, uh, we processed spoofed email from 985 government domains. Right? So this is things that somebody else has spoofed. Uh, 25, 26 million emails, blah, 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 blah. Not many of them were blocked. Why is that? So we can now go dig into this and say, we've set policy that says you know, those untrusted emails, 47% of those emails are untrusted. Why are they still being delivered? So we can go and start to work out what the problem is. Um, this is a year's worth of spoofs. This is just a volume of spoofs of addresses ending in gov.uk. And there are some really interesting spikes in there. So that big spike in February was a massive spam campaign in the name of government. Right? 150,000 mails a day or something. A big campaign. But a lot of those didn't get delivered. So instead of telling people you have to work out whether this is a real government mail or not, a lot of those didn't get delivered. And so you mitigate the harm. And then here's an interesting one. 
So nobody should ever send email from at gov.uk. It's always at department.gov.uk. So we set a top-level policy that says, oh, internet, if you ever see an email from at gov.uk, it's spoofed, don't deliver it, just send it back to us. What this tells you is in the last, well, nine months, we've had two and a half million of those. But for some bizarre, and, and the internet said 91% of those were untrusted. It understood they were not trusted emails. They shouldn't be delivered. And yet, 80% of them are still delivered. That last number, 20.5. No idea why. Right, so this, this only came out a couple of weeks ago. And we're trying to understand what's wrong on the internet that still allows untrusted emails to be delivered. But then we'll go fix it. And we fix it for our DMARC implementation. You fix it for everybody's. Right, so the idea is we can start to set the UK apart and say, if you get an email from a domain in the UK, it means something. And start to give people better quality data. Um, our, my job's about harm reduction. It's not about fear. So talking about phishing. So we've done some stuff with a company called um, Netcraft in Bath. Um, we've done some stuff to go and try and make the UK a safer place. So any phishing physically hosted in the UK used to last about a day and now lasts about an hour. That's good. You've got 20, 26 less hours to be hurt by clicking the link. Uh, Web injects in the UK used to be about a month. Now it's a couple of days. And then UK government phishing hosted anywhere in the world used to last about two days and is now about six hours. So this is about trying to reduce the, the harm window for people. Right. OK. Hands up if you're a statistician. Anybody? One, I'm sorry for what you're about to see. I apologize. Um, naive statistics, right? <laughs> So the left is phishing, the right is malware takedowns. Um, there's a strip chart at the top that says the majority of stuff we see is taken down pretty quickly. And the bottom says, if you're really, really naive and do stupid things that Pareto said in 1890 you should never do, it looks a bit like a power law. Right? And the power law says the stuff that lasts long has a disproportionate effect. So now we've got some data that says the right-hand side of those strip charts are interesting. Don't know why yet. But what if they all turn out to be Russian bulletproof hosting? Can we then go, right, the only thing that is ever hosted on these things is bad, so how about we don't root to them anymore? Because they don't take stuff down when you ask. Right? And again, trying to make it safer for people to go out on the internet. Um, it's all getting worse. Phishing, I, so the number of IPs that have been involved in phishing is up 47% this year, year on year. But in the UK, the UK share has gone down from 5.1 to 3.3. Now, I don't think one year's worth of data is sufficient to say that's causal, that what we are doing is causing that, but it's an interesting side statistic. So is the UK becoming harder for cyber criminals to operate in, yes or no? And we'll work that out over the next year. If the answer is yes, can you take what we're doing and scale it so other countries do the same and make it globally harder? That's the sort of thing we want to do. Um, this, <laughs> this is one of those, what the bloody hell was that? Slides, right? So the December, this is, um, so the big um, chunks of colour are malware mail servers. So these are mail servers sending malware out in the name of government or other brands we care about. December, you kind of get it, it's Christmas. August and September were weird, right? Somebody said it was school holidays. Well, yeah, but it was school holidays last year as well. And that didn't happen. The September one, we ended up with something like 150,000 emails a day coming from 18,000 open relays on the internet mail servers with 570 different flavors of malware attached. That's a big campaign. Thankfully, the guy that ran it is an idiot and used 16 command and control servers for all of it. So we take the command and control servers down and you mitigate all 500 versions of malware. Right? But that was an interesting response. What does it mean? Not sure yet. We need to do some more work on it. We've also seen a behavior change in the adversary. So we've seen them go from spoofing government domains that exist to spoofing non-existent government domains. We've got kind of a way we're thinking about how to fix that to doing these. So lookalike domains, right? So what is it? Tax refunds, hmrc.co.uk. So we are now taking zone transfers from DNS, looking for things that look like they're government spoofs and monitoring them. And what they do normally is they put non-malicious content up for a while and then sometime, a couple of months later, they'll launch a phishing campaign and put malicious content up. We monitor these things every hour. And so as soon as we know something's dodgy, like hmrclogin.co.uk, we set monitor it every hour. As soon as there's something dodgy up, we send a request to the hoster going, hey, this is bad, please take it down. Because until then, you can't actually take it down. 
hmrcrbastards.co.uk, by the way. <laughs> Turns out you can't take that down. <laughs> Um, we're also starting to do some stuff on social media. This is my favourite. Um, this is a man advertising driving test pass certificates um, with his real photo and his real phone number. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is great, human stupidity is better. Um, so we're just going looking for these sorts of things and taking them down. Not because they are particularly pernicious, but because they damage people's trust in government brand on the internet. And again, if we can show the data about this getting harder for people to do, we can say to other brands that people care about banks, etc., you should do something similar because here's the data that shows it's useful. I'm not allowed to swear anymore, apparently. I swear a lot. Um, SS7. So this is the international signaling system for telecoms. It is awful. Um, we've got a piece of work with the UK ISPs to say, let's make it better in the UK. You shouldn't be able to pull people's SMS messages from outside. You shouldn't be able to reroute voice. You shouldn't be able to do a whole bunch of stuff that you can currently do. Some of that's in place, and HMRC have been doing an experiment with one of the operators. So HMRC send out text messages to people from HMRC. Right? Turns out, if you are a criminal, it's trivial for you to send text messages from HMRC, so the from address being HMRC. So we've done some experiments over the last few months with uh, HMRC of lead and basically said, if a UK mobile has an SMS that says HMRC from, as its from address, it must have come from HMRC. Okay, we just try that as a manual thing. The complaints from HMRC's customers about SMS fraud have gone down by 90% in two months. That's awesome. So the next thing is how you scale that. So how do you come up with a set of TPOAs, these from addresses, that cannot be spoofed in the UK. And then you can have a big public messaging campaign that says if you get one from HMRC, it's golden. If you get it from anywhere else, <coughs> delete it. Right? Those are the sorts of things where you're starting to give people actionable advice. So you change the technology so that people can use it properly. Um, this is DNS. So this is just the volume of DNS queries over a week for, to our public sector DNS system uh, end of July. Right? The volumes aren't important. What's interesting? Okay, so it's obvious where the work week is, right? Big, spiky things. But these are interesting. These little beeps. Regular heartbeats. What are they? Is it malware beaconing out? What is it? Turns out that's security, security software updating signature files. But visualizing DNS like this lets you do things that you can't do any other way. Just looking at that and going, those little white peaks are weird. Right? You can see that immediately, and the analytics that run over this do some really cool stuff. This is a tool Nominet built called Turing. Um, I'm showing you two quite anodyne screenshots. There are some awesome analytics behind this. The problem is, if I show you, I show you which departments have been pwned. That's not on, really. But in the first eight weeks of this thing running, we had 50 departments on it. Uh, we've got uh, four Conficker infections. Yay, 2007. <laughs> um, we've got four Conficker, two Quackbot, one Ramnit, right, that nobody knew about, but we spot in DNS. Uh, we've had some interesting internal misconfigurations where departments are trying to resolve internal addresses externally. That's bad. Sorry, that's just another cool data screen. And we got this. So one of the analytics on the back end is Markov analysis, right? They don't look like proper addresses to me. They look like domain generation algorithms for malware. And we found that when we find config, it's by matching it to the DGA. Nobody knows what the hell this is. This is a completely unknown set of things that look like a domain generation <laughs> algorithm. So it's either weird misconfigurations, weird data being generated some other way, or unknown malware. And we're digging into that to try and find out what it is. But that's in the first eight weeks. That's kind of cool, right? Um, I'm going to finish on incidents, because that's what everybody really wants to know about. So that's the number of C1, C2s, and C3. So category three is, oh look, another defense contract has been done and a terabyte of data has been nicked. Category two is something that requires a proper response, you know, us actually intervening. And a category one would be a national event. So one acquire was a category two. That's in 11 months. That's a lot, right? The thing that's that we're working through this is, What's the root cause analysis that you do across these? What are the things that actually cause these attacks? And can you extract those out and generalize them and say to people, if you do this, this is likely to be the impact. This is the compromise you will have. And we're starting to try and do that. It's really difficult. 
but we've learned a lot over those 600 incidents. I'm going to pick two out, though, just to finish. So these two are really interesting. Um, one was comprom global compromise of managed service providers. Right? So these are the people who manage your IT for you. And one was a, an attack against internet edge routers in telcos. So taking over your internet edge that goes out to the, you know, your router that goes out to the internet in the telco. Um, they're interesting for two reasons. The first one is, this is a single attack that gets you hundreds of customers. So you attack one network, one thing, that gets you hundreds of those customers. So it's kind of a meta attack. And that's interesting. It's an interesting change in, um, change in MO. The really interesting thing for me is part of the response to both of these is changing global business models. Right? So it's not just fixing the tech. It's how you change the global business models of managed service providers, of telcos, so that you can better protect people you really care about. Not quite sure how we're going to do that, but at least we've got some data to try. That was me done. <laughs>